Hi friends, welcome to Bookish Bliss, our virtual book club. Every week we will dig into a section of chapters in our favorite books. Let's get started. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to episode 16 of Bookish Bliss. We have a lot to discuss today. Yes, this week we are covering chapters 21 through 32 of A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J. Mass. There will be no spoilers beyond the covered chapters. You don't have to read the whole book to listen. You just have to be caught up on the chapters we're covering. Yes. Amanda, what are you drinking tonight? Megan, I'm drinking LaCroix and Tito's again. It's become my new favorite. I know. It's like, I kind of... <laughs> and it has less calories than wine. Yes. I do kind of like <laughs> so. that. We did say like, sip wine with us and get cozy, but I think people should be able to drink whatever they want to drink while they're listening to this That's episode. Right. It's your choice, just like Reese. <laughs> It's your choice, whatever (laughs) brand of liquor you want, or it could just be a ginger ale. We won't judge you. It is your choice. water. (laughs) What are you drinking tonight, Megan? Well, I still had what was left of the bottle from last week. So we're going to finish this off tonight. And obviously, we're pouring on camera. Let's go. I like it. I got my ice. It's a nice night. And... I'm ready to record. (laughs) Me too. Hold on. Let me just put the tap tap back on. (laughs) I have not had anything to drink yet. Okay. Well, cheers to episode 16. Cheers. Cheers. Episode 16, baby. Woohoo. Now let's get started with the good stuff and break down Akawar part three. Over to you, Meg. Please summarize this set of chapters for us. My favorite part of every week, just kidding, it's my second favorite part. (laughs) I'm going to summarize this set of chapters, and then later on we'll be gathering some more information and really digging into that plot because so much happened. So much. Chapter 21. Reese and Feyre are planning a trip to the Bone Carver, except this time Cassian will be escorting our gal to the prison. Nesta works on her magical training with Amran, and Feyre's nightmares are back. No! Chapter 22. We're off to see the Bone Carver, the wonderful, all-knowing Bone Carver. <laughs> <laughs> That was amazing. But not before recent stern warning to be careful. The carver congratulates Feyre on becoming High Lady. He teases Cassian about Nesta, but in all seriousness, what the heck is Nesta? Yeah, what is she? I need to know. Chapter 23. Who would have thought the bone carver would have siblings? But how did we not see the weaver being his older sister? Feyre tries to negotiate with the bone carver to assist them in this war, but he's feeling mighty comfy in his cell away from his siblings. He will only help with receiving one magical object. And of course, if they can break him out. Yeah, that was a freaking shock and a half. <laughs> Chapter 24. Elaine is talking in riddles. Lucian and Elaine have their first conversation where she basically calls him a backstabbing little biatch. Feyre mm-hmm. slips into Lucian's mind for the umpteenth time. Get it together, Lucian. Work on that shield. Nesta <laughs> manages not to murder Lucian or Resand, and everyone is moving into the townhouse. Also, a lot of chatter about mates. More on that later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Chapter 25. We are back in the Court of Nightmares and our inner circle all have their game faces on. Even Nesta seems to fit in. Feyre shows off her powers a bit, but the most shocking scene was Eris walking into the council chamber while they were having their meeting with Care. Yes. Another unexpected moment. Yes. Wild. Chapter 26. Care is a loser and a big pain in my ass. He wants (laughs) access to Valeris for all of his people in the human city. This is a war, so what needs to be done needs to be done. Moore is pissed. Eris is smug as ever, but somehow no one gets physically hurt, though everyone is mentally drained after their time in the Court of Nightmares. Chapter 27. The inner circle is fighting. Well, Moore is just yelling at everyone. Amarin turns from unexpected peacekeeper to pissed off when she finds out about their visit to the bone carver. This chapter ends with Elaine saying more weird shit and Feyre is exhausted. Mm Mm-hmm. Chapter 28, random chapter. Feyre trains. Feyre tries to fly. Feyre steals Moore's pastry. Some High Lords have responded to the High Lords meeting, and a healer sees Elaine, and nothing is wrong with her. Hmm. Hmm. 
Chapter 29, the most awkward date ever between Lucian and Elaine. Favorite again tries to fly. We hear an uplifting story. And then we get a steamy scene between Race and Feyre. Woohoo! <laughs> Chapter 30. Feyre cancels her training with both Cassie and Azrael. Girl needs a break. She mm-hmm. is going to research with Nesta today in the library. They attempt to have a heart-to-heart, but are interrupted by the Highburn Ravens. Yikes. Wild. Chapter 31. They want Nesta bad. They want to bring her back to make her give back what she took from the cauldron. The queens. Period. Exclamation point. Are alive. What the fuck? We'll leave it at that for right now. (laughs) Another epic escape by Feyre, but she does have to enlist a monster in the pit to kill the Highburn Raven so she can make it out alive. Cassie and Arise eventually show up, but her bargain is already made. Mm-hmm. In our last chapter in this section, chapter 32, Resand is pissed. P.O. What's done is done with the bargain, but at least Highburn has showed some of their cards. They make it back to the townhouse, and apparently Elaine is a seer. Mm-hmm. More on that later. Whoa, what a wild set of chapters. Wild. It was just insane. Everything that, like, I don't even know how I'm going to continue to make predictions. It's just too wild mm-hmm. at this point. <laughs> Yeah, there's really been no chapter or section that we've done where there's been nothing really happening. Yeah. It's kind of been action-packed, action-packed, action-packed. And I think it's going to get just continue this way through the rest of the book. Yeah, I agree. It's wild. But thank you so much for those amazing, funny summaries. The best entertainment of my week. <laughs> I do try to make them a little bit more fun than just like, blah, 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 this happened, yeah. blah, 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 the end. <laughs> well, you do a magnificent job. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> but now I have the great honor of turning it over to you to go over where our characters have been in this set of chapters. Yes, we are going to start with Cassian, who's going to escort Feyre down to the prison. If they both had gone, meaning Feyre and Rhysan, it would have looked too desperate, too vital. Mm. Though I like that Cassian went with her. Me too. Because then we get more information on Nesta. And I think that if anyone else had gone with Faber, we wouldn't have gotten that information. Yeah, I agree. For sure. Amran is training Nesta, working on her mental shields. She's teaching her to build walls in her mind. Walls that Amran was teaching her to sense, to find the holes through, and repair them in preparation for their defense with the wall. <laughs> The wall. The wall. The legendary wall. I cannot imagine learning from Amran, though. She's going to be so honed in on her powers and so powerful. I just cannot wait to see. Yeah, no, definitely. What she does. But just watching them do what they're doing, they're just staring at each other. They're like having the longest lasting don't blink contest. I know. It doesn't look like much is going on, but you know something crazy is brewing up there. Amran also hangs out with Nesta in the Hewn City. And she brought her to a room full of treasures, strange objects, some that wanted to hurt them as if they were alive for a training exercise with the form of magic designed to repel intruders like the wall will be. So everything is in preparation. She's doing all these different exercises all so that she can repair the tears in the wall. Hopefully she'll be our saving grace. Yes. (laughs) Our saving Nesta. Maybe. I think, yeah, well, I know something crazy is going to happen. It's not going to be that easy, but she's going to try. She's going to do her best to do what she can to help (laughs) in the war. Nesta also says she made the cauldron give something to her. And we know the cauldron wants it back. It's so weird because it makes it sound like the cauldron is like this person I like know this live thing which it kind of is but it really is just an inanimate object I know but it's so crazy how it's already punishing people for what she took so you know, know. everybody that wants to use that cauldron to their advantage at some point is coming after Nesta now yeah and they're like what did you take Nesta and she she doesn't know yeah she just knows she took something but she doesn't even know what that is but more on that later I feel like we'll find out soon For sure. For sure. Elaine actually left her room for the first time. Feyre found her in the family library. She was still pale and ghostly, but she admits she can see very far now. Hmm. All the way Mm. to the sea. Elaine also sees something and thinks it's a dream. She says, I can hear her crying. Everyone thinks she's dead, but she's not. Only different. Changed. As I was. Who? Feyre asks her. 
Azrael asked her what she saw, and she said, I saw young hands wither with age. I saw a box of black stone. I saw a feather of fire land on snow and melt it. They think she had must gone mad. But we now know that it was the queen who never came to the meetings in the mortal land that she's seeing. Asriel finally puts it together that Elaine was made into a seer from the cauldron. She said, the queen might come, the one who was cursed, but not by the cauldron, the other one. Ooh. Just a little update on Feyre. She's having those intense nightmares again. That she's almost vomiting, but Rhysand talks her to calmness, of course. Thank God for Reese. Mm -hmm. Feyre also wants to move her sisters to the townhouse after Elaine's interaction with Lucian. So they're joining us in the townhouse. There's all these people now living in this townhouse. It's a full house. And even Lucian mentions how crazy it is that Reese is living in a townhouse. Could you imagine? It's probably a normal size house with now six, seven people in it. How many people is it now? Well, when I picture a townhouse, I don't even picture it as a full house. It's like a half a house. Yeah. And now all these people are living in this like <laughs> tiny townhouse in the middle of the city. It's wild. He's like, yeah, I know that there's no formality in this court. <laughs> Reese lives in a townhouse. With a bunch of people, not even just by himself. I think he's going to need an upgrade. <laughs> yeah, I agree. We learn about Jasminda when Feyre jumps into Lucian's mind during his interaction with Elaine. She had been all laughter and mischief, wild and free. She had teased Lucian, taunted him, seduced him thoroughly that he hadn't wanted anything but her. She had chosen Yay! him, but Elaine had been thrown at him. So I guess we'll see how that goes. Lucian tells Asriel everything he needs to know about the Autumn Court, his family and their allies. He kept some personal details to himself, but told him everything else. So Lucian is officially in the inner circle, baby. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think they're starting to trust him a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially since they took his advice on where they should suggest the High Lord's meeting to be, and they sent out those recommendations. And when that one didn't fail, they keep coming to Lucian. And yeah. it seems like Rhysand was very pleased with the work that Lucian is doing for them at this time. So I think he still has to earn his, you know, trust with the group. Yeah. But I think he's doing a pretty good job at the moment. I think so, too. And yes, he seems to not have a lot to do at the moment. But when they do utilize him, like they, they really listen to what he's saying yeah. and respect what he's saying. They are not growling at him. They're not barking at him. They're not putting him down in or any way. Or jealous of he him or... <laughs> Yeah, he got read the riot act when he first got to Valoris. And then since then, it's like, you're on your own. Like, thank you for helping us, but we're not going to bother you unless you fuck up. Exactly. Yeah. Rhysand says that Asriel has been asking himself the question of whether the mating bond would have snapped into place already for more in him for hundreds of years, which I think is so interesting. Yeah. Hundreds of years. I think it definitely would have snapped into place by now. Yeah. But poor Asriel is just holding on hope. He reveals to Feyre that it was actually Cassian and Reese that taught him how to fly later in life, which is why he's now giving her flying lessons because they have that in common. They're learning later in life. Mm -hmm. Not going so well for her in this set of chapters, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. It's funny for us. I not know. so funny for her. Yeah. Moore's mother is present for the first time when the gang is in the Hewn City, which I thought was interesting. I'm like, hmm... Why are we learning about her now all of a sudden? What's going on here? Yeah. Moore is pissed at Rhysand for bringing Eris into the Hewn City and giving care access to Valaris. She's not just pissed. She looks scared. Yeah. She definitely looks scared. Why is she so scared? Why is Moore? she so scared? Good fucking question, Megan. <laughs> Kier has some demands though for participating in the war against Highburn. He wants out of the mountain for him and his court to be free and have full access to Valeris that he learned existed from the King of Highburn, of course. Yeah, I think after the attack on Valoris, it was probably very hard not to notice that something was going on in their lands <laughs> when they're like, wait, what is over there and why would Highburn be attacking that if it wasn't a city? Yeah. And then, of course, it probably all just clicks into place. Of course, that's where my daughter goes. There is another city in this territory. Yeah. And I think it's a good bargaining chip, honestly. Mm hmm it's so weird mm -hmm. that they can decide that they don't want to fight in the war or not, though. I think that's the stupidest rule. Eris walks into the council chamber in the Hewn City. 
Did not see that on my bingo card for Akawar. <laughs> I do have to say that I also did not have that in my mind when I read it the first time. I was like, wait, what? Why the f- is Eris here? I know, especially because we haven't heard from the Autumn Court yet if they're in on the meeting or not. So you're obviously in contact with them. So why won't you just respond to the meeting request? I don't know. Yeah, I honestly have a lot to say about this meeting, but I'll save it for the plot section. Yes. Eris kept Feyre's powers to himself and knows that they erased his brother's minds of that information. He will keep her secret in exchange for the throne. He wants Reese to kill his father, but Reese doesn't agree to that. It's too messy, but he will back Eris up when it's time. Also, we learned something interesting about Lucian's past. Eris mm-hmm. wasn't there when they killed Jesminda. It was the only order he denied from his father ever. He made sure that Lucian got through to the spring court safely when he learned his father had planned to kill him next, which I thought was very interesting because he's described as the most brutal of them all, of all the brothers. Yeah, I think that Eris is a a lot more like Lucian than we actually think. Yeah. And I think he wears a lot of masks just like Rhysand does. And I don't think he's as brutal as we think he is. I think he's very cunning. Yeah. And I think that he knows how to play the game really well. Yeah. And I think he knows that if he's not the brother that gets the throne, that the Autumn Court is like going downhill. Like I think even with Baron, it's not the best place to be. But I think he knows if he's not the one that becomes the High Lord of the Autumn Court that they're all screwed. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I was also surprised that we learned so much about Amryn in this section, she tells us a story of how she escaped the prison. She bound herself Mm -hmm. into the body that she is in now. She had to make herself mortal, immortal as they all are, but mortal compared to what she was. She was always different, even when she was what she used to be. She did not regret, did not mourn, and did not experience pain. But she was too curious, too questioning. The day the rip appeared in the sky, curiosity drove her. Her brothers and sisters fled upon the orders of their ruler, but she wanted to look, and she went through the tear in the sky and ended up in Prithian. She cannot unbound herself, but if she was unbound, she wouldn't remember her people, and she would not care for anyone. She would either smite them or abandon them. What she feels now would be foreign to her. It would hold no sway. She also admits her name was not really Amryn, but she can't remember her given name. Wild. Wild. Like, what was she? I know. And I want to know what world she came from. Like, who was her master? I just need more about Amryn, too. So maybe that's another prequel story that I need. (laughs) The arrival of Amryn and then the bone carver, the weaver, that kind of story. Yeah, because she says she has brothers and sisters, too. So I'm like... Hmm. Are we going to see some of these monsters as her brothers and sisters? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll see. So we do hear from some of the High Lords in this section. Helion will join them. b said he will come, but won't do it unless it's in a truly neutral, safe location. And Callius will come, but he wants to bring armed guards. Day, Dawn, and Winter are their closest allies. No word from anyone else in the spring, summer, or autumn courts. Reese later receives word from Crusader, though, that Tarquin is contemplating siding with them and attending the meeting. The healer, Magia, comes to examine Elaine, and she deemed her healthy, but she can't get into her mind. She is cauldron made. She's not like the rest of them. The healer cannot pierce the places it left its mark most deeply, the mind and the soul. She had also previously healed Cassian and Asriel many times, and even Reese during the war. She said Lucian, as Elaine's mate, should try to talk to her because the mating bond is a bridge between two souls. I love that little tidbit there about the mating bond. Yeah, that is so nice. Yeah. We learn about Draken's people, the Seraphim. They are winged, but they have feathers. Their army and society allow women to lead, fight, and to rule. All of them are gifted with mighty magic of wind and air. I love these people already. Right? We learn the story of the Nefel philosophy, which I also love this story. I love this story. It's so good. When the Seraphim were met with an army charging after them, knowing their forces were too small to face them, they cleaved the sea itself, made a path through the water all the way through the channel, and ordered the humans to run. 
but Miriam insisted on remaining behind until every last one of her people had crossed. They got about halfway when the army reached them. The seraphim battled them on the floor of the sea. It was bloody and brutal and chaotic, and they didn't see Miriam get skewered by the queen herself. Nefel, a cartographer, was rejected from the legion fighting ranks. Her wings were too small and one somewhat malformed, but she became Miriam's dearest friend during those long months as she helped Draken find the geographical advantages in their battles. Nefel found Miriam and not only carried her, who was triple her weight, but she flew, and because she was so small, she was able to escape the seas crashing down upon them. Miriam is alive today because of Nefel. The most unlikely person can alter the course of history. Love that. That I just think, is that foreshadowing? Yes, I was just gonna say you took the words out of my mouth. That is totally foreshadowing that Feyre is gonna fly and soar at some traumatic time in this book. Or does it mean the last thing you said that the most unlikely person can alter the course of history? Yes, I think that could also be foreshadowing too. Who is the most unlikely person? Nesta or Elaine? I guess we'll have to keep reading to find out. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. These stupid king's ravens come into our story. They find Nesta and Feyre in the library in the House of Wind. They winnowed in Mm -hmm. using a spell from the king's spell book that could only be used once. They came for Nesta, but Feyre was a bonus. The cauldron couldn't shatter the wall, not because of the power that it spent, but because Nesta had stolen too much of it. What a queen. What a queen. I love Nesta and I'm so glad she did that. (laughs) Speaking of the queens. Speaking of these fucking queens who are fucking alive. (laughs) Like what the fuck? They're alive. I should have known it wasn't going to be that easy to kill them off. I literally had to listen to you say that they were dead for weeks. I know. You just let me go. They're dead. They're dead. They're dead. They're dead every five seconds. (laughs) I'm like, okay, whatever you say. God damn it. (laughs) You are usually right, but I I thought about telling you, but it was just too entertaining (laughs) because like I really wanted to see your reaction, which I did get to see. Yeah your reaction because I, I think pissed. I was reading the part when you're like they're alive <laughs> I was like no before you even got there I saw it coming I was like these motherfuckers are alive yeah they're still alive and well only one of them has really paid a price yeah but- so I was gonna get to that next where since Nessa took so much from the cauldron it was pissed and took something from the first queen that jumped in the beautiful young one It gave her immortality, but it took her youth and made her a withered old crone. The other queens were obviously too afraid to go in after that. And the youngest one wanted Nesta to pay. They all want Nesta to pay, honestly, because the other ones want to be immortal too. So Yeah, but they don't want to look like that. What a twist of events. Oh, no. Who would? No, I know. I just keep thinking, I said this to you the other night when we read the chapter, that I keep thinking of the witch from Snow White with the hunchback and the war on the nose. And the huge, wrinkly, frickin' nose and face. Yeah. <laughs> With the long, bony fingers. Oh. Do you want an apple? <laughs> <laughs> we also finally meet the mysterious monster at the bottom of the library as it comes to Nesta and Feyre's aid when the ravens enter the House of Wind. Mm-hmm. Feyre makes a bargain with it for it to agree to kill the ravens. She will give it company to tell them about life. Interesting. Interessante. <laughs> Interessante indeed. Indeed. But that's that's about where all of our characters are at in this section. We'll obviously jump into more of the details during the plot and foreshadowing section. Mm-hmm. But before we get there, let's go over a little bit of our world building. Ooh. The bone carver is up first in this section. Yes, the bone carver. We're going to see the bone <laughs> carver, the bone carver, the bone carver. I or my it. latest rendition of, we're off to see the bone carver. <laughs> yes the wonderful bone cover of all Woo, he knows all i can't i love it cassian tells Feyre there was a life here before the high lords took prithian old gods they called them they ruled the forests and the rivers and the mountains some were those things then the magic shifted to the high fey who brought the cauldron and the mother along with them and those old gods were still worshipped by a select few but most people forgot about them 
the bone carver was one of those old gods and his sister was the weaver, which we also learned. Mm -hmm. No one knows how he ended up in the prison, but the bone carver appeared again as a young boy to Feyre. This time, she realized, though, that the boy looked like Rhysan and had her mouth. She was seeing their future son, should they survive long enough to bear him. Whoa. Whoa. Is that some foreshadowing? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. For <laughs> yeah? I think for sure. Yeah. If the bone carver is like, here's your future kid. Or is it like taunting them like, this is what you could have had, but you're going to fucking have to fight in this war instead. <laughs> I don't think I don't think the bone carver is cruel. I think he likes okay. to play games oh. to get but what he But does he see wants? the future? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Game changer. He knows everything. Wow. So they're going to eventually have a kid. If the bone carver is correct. If he's correct. But I would think that it is for- foreshadowing. Feyre had brought the bone carver a small shard of bone that was all that was left of the Ator. Mm-hmm. He does love to play games because he teases Feyre about Nesta, how they trembled when she emerged and how she took something from the cauldron. Yes, but he's not incorrect. Everything that comes out of his mouth is true. He doesn't lie. Yeah. The bone carver reveals that his twin sister is a weaver and her previous name was Striga. They also have an older brother, Koshi. He was confined and bound by his little lake on the continent. They are all death gods, but the bone carver siblings were much stronger, and he is scared shit of them, which makes me scared shit of them. Well, yeah, we've already <laughs> encountered the weaver. We know she is no joke. Yeah, she's definitely mean and scary. I can't imagine what the older brother is like if that's what the weaver is like. No, I know. Amran tells us that the cost of freeing the bone carver from the prison was binding him into a body, making him fey. But Aaron doesn't think he'll agree to it, especially without the Ouroboros. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the Ouroboros, mm-hmm. it was one mirror from the Weaver's collection that was old, even when they, the Weaver, the Bone Carver, and their older brother were young. A window to the world. All could be seen. All could be told through its dark surface. Kier possesses it, an heirloom of his household. The Bone Carver wants it in return for his aid in the war. But... To claim it, you must first look into it, and everyone who has attempted to do so has either gone mad or been broken beyond repair. Even a high lord or two, if legend is true. Kier says, Reese can take it if he dares to face it. Oh, boy. This just adds on to so many things that I want to say during a later episode, because how does Kier's household have all these magical objects? I know that his family used to be in charge of the night court, but it's just interesting how they have access to these would-be witchy magical objects. So... Well, they also say it was the weavers, so maybe someone stole it from the cottage. But who? And how did they get it? And did they go mad? Is that why their family is no longer in power in the night court? Ooh, that's good. That just popped into that my head. That could be. <laughs> that definitely could be for sure. Sometimes I say things that's and good. I'm like, where did that come from? I don't know, but that's fucking delicious. We need more of those thoughts, Megan. <laughs> I have them. I just can't say them because a lot of our readers or listeners have not read all of their books. Well, including me. Yeah, including you. I'm them. I'm her. (laughs) So sometimes I have to go, "Mm." we'll get there. Yeah. Slowly but surely, but we'll get there. We learn a little bit more about the mating bond from Reese. Mm -hmm. So we already know that a mating bond can be rejected. There is a choice. Sometimes, yes, the bond picks poorly. Sometimes the bond is nothing more than some preordained guesswork as to who will provide the strongest offspring. At its basis level, it's perhaps only that. Some natural function, not an indication of true paired souls. Other courts, and on the continent, there are territories that believe that females literally belong to their mate, but not there on Rhysand's land. No. That would suck. Fuck that. I know. Could you imagine? And then it's like, how could the cauldron or the mother think that Elaine and Lucian are the best pairing. That's why I'm like, "Mm, mm." yeah, I don't know. Same. I don't think so. I don't think so either. So we do get to see the council chamber in the hewn city with some surprise guests. It was similar to the throne room in size and decor with the huge black glass table splitting the room. Mm -hmm. We also learn what a fleeting spell is, a spell of mighty power able to wield only once to great effect. One capable of cleaving wards. 
Amran immediately adapted the wards against such things and then began combing through the city to find if the king also deposited any other cronies before he vanished. And finally, on to fast magic. Time for fast magic, my favorite section. Woo, fast magic, fast magic. <laughs> go, go, fast magic. <laughs> I know. We're just going to keep trying different jingles until one sticks. Yes, but I do love fast magic. I love it so much. Me too. We just need a little fast magic. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I know. We need to like play something that you just like hit a button and then it like yeah. has like fireworks exploding. <laughs> fireworks. <laughs> For magic. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Fast magic. There's obviously some generic winnowing happening throughout this section. Favor won't be able to communicate with Resan through the bond while she's down in the prison because of wards and spells that are far older than Prithian. Favor had summoned her wings, but fell 20 feet onto two hard stone. Mm -hmm. Favor throws a wall up of air to keep Nesta from interfering with Lucian <laughs> and Elaine. Then she jumps into Lucian's mind and gets a glimpse into his thoughts during their interaction. Some of those tantrums of power from members of the Hewn City dared to climb up this first step towards Favor on the throne. She slammed Talon Sharp Magic down upon those two curious powers. Resan and Feyre communicate through their bond in the meeting with Care and Eris in the Hewn City. There is a shield of air that blocks them in while Amran tells her story about how she got out of the prison to them. Feyre is practicing using her wings by gliding into the House of Wing, but fails. Many times. Many times. <laughs> Lots of trees were injured in this section. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were not spared. No. Feyre grabs a pastry out of Moore's hand and finishes it. So Moore snaps her fingers and a plate of melon appears from the kitchen. Lucian tugs on the bond between him and Elaine, and she was all freaked out by it. Yeah, probably because it doesn't feel right because they're not real mates. True. True, Megan. Just keep spitting out the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Reese makes Feyre's clothes vanish as she collapses into the bath after an exhausting day of training and preparing for this war. I want Reese to vanish my clothes. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. okay. Put me in a steamy bath. Yeah. <laughs> Rub me down with oil. Yeah. Hyburn's ravens were in Valeris. One of the ravens threw Feybane dust at Feyre, wiping out her magic. Feyre was permanently marked by a tattoo from her bargain with the monks under the library. And last but not least, Rhysand sends a vision to Feyre of Cassian's initial moments in the pit of the library since she was curious when he found her sister. And that's all I have for fast magic today. The end. <laughs> Gotta go. Can't join you for the plot and <laughs> foreshadowing lines. <laughs> You've been doing such a great job. I think I'll just skedaddle. I know you're going to do great, Megan. Take us back to chapter 21. All right, I'll do that. But first, I'm going to pour myself some more wine because I already drank that glass while you were doing your Perfect. characters and... Ooh, maybe I'll <gasps> add a little Tito's and it's soda. Empty. Oh shit! Oh, All right, we get in crunk tonight. Fast magic pumped us up. <laughs> Give me a second wind. That fast magic. Yeah. All right, let me take a sip. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Chapter twenty one. Resan went to find Cassian to ask if he would escort Feyre to see the Bone Carver. It would look, one, less desperate, and two, Cassian is obsessed with facts about the monsters in the prison. He literally is a walking fact book when it comes to every yes. single prisoner in there. Yeah, he knows everything. Feyre went to find Amran and Nesta to see how their first training session was going. She found them staring at each other. Amran has her own ways of teaching, and it appears <laughs> she was teaching Nesta how to shield herself since they would be heading to the Hewan City. And as we know, mm -hmm. it is very important to shield yourself when you're in the Court of Nightmares. Definitely. Amran also informs Feyre that she has no time for history lessons about any of the prisoners. Feyre is trying to, like, poke and prod to see if she can get any information out of Amran about the prison and the people inside of it without, you know, raising too much suspicion. Yes. This is my notable line for chapter 21, page 226. Amran bared her teeth. I am giving a magic lesson, not a history one. If you want someone to gossip with, go find one of the dogs. I'm sure Cassian's still sniffing around upstairs. <laughs> 
I love her sass. Yeah, because Amra knows if Nesta's around, Cassian is probably not too far away. Yep, she's very well aware. <laughs> More later in this chapter is very wary of what Care may ask Reese for in order for him to help to bring in his Darkbringer Legion into this war. And this chapter ends with Thera having another nightmare. This time they're under the mountain again. Nesta and Aline are both impaled on the wall like Claire had been. And Amarantha was leading Rhysand away from her. His wings were out. And Amarantha was going to bring him to her bedroom to dot, 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 and destroy his wings. Rhys commanded her awake from her nightmare, demanding her to breathe. Though that is such a scary nightmare to have your sisters yeah impaled like Claire was to see Reese being walked away with Amarantha with his wings out which he never showed before oh I just like can't even. but thank god Reese has her under control wakes her up from her dreams she thought she might throw up and she leaned over the bed but Reese just rubbed her back throughout the entire thing oh she vowed what a good hubby I know he's <laughs> such a good husband She's such a good hub. She vows that they will never, never be in that situation again, and no one would hurt them or her sisters ever again. Never! Just kidding. Never! Never! <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 22. The next morning, Feyre and Rhysand are getting ready for their day. Feyre does share her nightmare with Reese after breakfast, and he just kisses her in response. He's totally just there for her with everything she needs, sorry. And yeah. he doesn't push to get this information. He waits until Feyre is ready to share it with him, and it's just such a drastic change. I know we keep saying that over and over again, but Rhysand is just such a respectful dude. I know. He's just perfect. He's always there for her. Yes. And I'm going to say that now because I am going to criticize him in a couple chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Cassian is totally grossed out when he walks into the house and sees Feyre and Reese kissing. And Reese kind of gives him a look like, you need to calm down. You need to stop that. <laughs> Reese and winnows them both to the prison. He warns that Feyre will not be able to use the bond while she's in there. Reese is not in a joking mood. He reminds Cassian of all the monsters he put in there when Cassian calls him a mother hen. Reese is never calm when it comes to Feyre's safety. This time, Feyre is going into that prison without him being there to protect her. Yeah. And even though he knows Feyre can hold her own, and we know that, he still has that mating instinct that he wants to protect his mate at all times. Yeah, and I feel like it probably does freak him out that they're not going to be able to talk through their bond either Yeah, because of the wars. And he knows what that feels like already when the Fabian was in her system when she was escaping from the spring court. Yeah. Cassian and Feyre make the trek up the mountain, and Cassian wants to know if she really thinks the bone carver will help them in the war. Feyre said, you're the general, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Cassian just says the bone carver is bad. He is worried about controlling him so they don't get their asses handed to them by Highburn and then their asses handed to them by the bone carver and that they'd be fighting two wars at the same time and they just can't afford that. Yeah, they definitely can't afford that. And here's my notable line for chapter 22, page 233. The carver is that bad? You're asking this right before we're about to meet with him? <laughs> I assume Reese would have put his foot down if it was that risky. Reese had been known to hatch plans that make my heart stop dead. So I wouldn't count on him to be the voice of reason. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line because it's so true. Me too. It's so true. Yeah. Reese will do anything to protect his family and Valaris and now Feyre. So really no plan is off limits for Reese and. Yeah. Definitely. Feyre in this moment is also hoping that Amran will tell her how she escaped from the prison so that they can get the bone carver out when needed. When they are walking down and down and down, Feyre is thinking this is a bad idea. And Cassian said, well, it most certainly is a bad idea. But in war, you don't have the luxury for good ideas, only sorting yeah. through the bad ones, which is so true. Yeah. No matter what, you've got to make a tough decision mm -hmm. in war. They arrive at the bone carver's cell and they step inside hand in hand. They are united front, standing against the bone carver and anything he might try to say. Yes. The bone carver congratulates Feyre on becoming High Lady. 
Feyre gives him the bone of the Ator, and she now realizes she's seeing the face of her future son, which is just beyond freaky. Freaky, freaky. Yeah, wild. She never tells Rhysan that. She has not told him yet, no. Not yet, no. I want to know who Cassian saw, because for the first couple seconds in there, he yeah. looked pale. He looked frightened to the bone, and he finally snaps out of it after a little bit. I wonder if he sees Nesta. Oh, yeah. Or maybe that monster in the pit. Oh, maybe the monster in the pit, yeah. But the bone carver is taunting Cassian about Nesta, so maybe he is seeing mm-hmm. Nesta. True. The bone carver says how Nesta took more than she should have, and she took it with her teeth. We know Nesta <laughs> went into that cauldron fighting, pointing her finger at the King of Highburn, and, and so it doesn't surprise me that she ripped the cauldron apart with her fucking teeth. Nope, it does not fucking surprise me at all. What a savage. Yeah. The bone carver also says what went in is not what came out, and they are not the same. That Nesta was like his sister, who was a queen, which is another foreshadowing line Mm -hmm. about Nesta being a queen at some point. Like we've been saying since literally Akatar. And I endorsed Amanda's prediction on this. And we just (laughs) we just keep seeing the line over and over again in every book. It has to mean something for sure. And he calls Cassian the Prince of Bastards. So he is lining up royalty next to Cassian's name, but only after he calls Nesta a queen, which is so Mm -hmm. funny because you know, I love my royalty. I'm obsessed with England and their royal family. (laughs) And when the queen was the queen for many, many years, her husband was a prince consort, not a king, because you never want it to seem like he is higher than her if she's the ruler. So that's what made me think if they're going to be tied together, which we obviously don't know, but we've seen some foreshadowing for that, that if she's a queen, is he her prince consort? Yes. Yes. I full send that. Full send. (laughs) Full full send. Full approval. Full send. (laughs) And the bone carver also says, what did she do drowning in the ageless dark? What did she take? So even the bone carver isn't quite sure what Nesta took. He seems pretty perplexed about what even was taken from the cauldron. Nesta doesn't know. The bone carver doesn't seem to know. I don't even know if the cauldron really knows what was taken from it. So we're going to have to wait and find out. But they know she took it by her teeth. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Feyre says, well, if you want to find out, then you need to stop talking. They have the book of breathings and maybe there would be a way to find a way home for a price for the bone carver to help them in some way. Maybe they could send him home. And the bone cover says, I'm listening. Which brings us to chapter 23. Feyre is talking about the upcoming war with the bone carver. The carver will ask a price and Cassian says it has to be within reason. The carver is like, you think I want to go back home? He does not even think the world he came from exists anymore. And Feyre said, well, maybe we can just improve your living conditions then. Like, what do you want? And he tells her, curse breaker, I am exactly where I want to be in this cell, which is now changing really this entire conversation because from her first conversation with the bone carver, it seemed like he was very interested in death and what she saw and what happened to her in this idea of home. And now we learn that he's not interested in going home at all yeah but we know why now too (laughs) yes we learn his sister is the weaver we learn that a powerful warrior Faye, can find his sister to the middle and his older brother to a lake he is scared of his siblings powers and he did not want them to even remember he was still existing in this world so he wants his siblings to forget he existed that he's dead or in another world he does not want them remembering that he is at the prison yeah and no offense to the weaver but i wouldn't fucking want her to remember that she was my sister either (laughs) literally sorry (laughs) so i don't blame the bone cover at all (laughs) for real and here's my note of the line for chapter 23 page 240 I am forgotten. That's what I am. And that's how I prefer to be. So you will find that I do not wish to leave, that I have no desire to remind my sister and brother that I am alive and in this world. 
contained and diminished as they are, their influence remains considerable. Hmm. Which is so interesting because mm. what influence do they still have? Who are they yeah. in cahoots with that they would be able to have power over what happens to the bone carver? Interessante. I know. Interesting. And who is this warrior fae who banishes them to all these different parts of the world? The bone carver said he put himself in the prison and let himself, well, he didn't put himself there, but he let himself be trapped so that his siblings would not be able to get to them. So whoever put him there, did they help him, maybe? I don't know if they necessarily knew that they were helping the bone carver be imprisoned in the prison. I think that he just let himself be caught. Because okay. I think the bone carver doesn't do anything without calculation and know exactly where he's going to end up because he knows everything. Right. Or it knows everything. I don't know if it's a boy or girl. Who knows? <laughs> we know there's a sister and a brother, but what is the bone carver? I yeah. Know. I don't know. His siblings are death gods. He said even Highburn would not be foolish enough to unleash his siblings if they won this war. Because Cassian's basically like, I think it's in your best interest to help us in this war because if Highburn wins, maybe they'll unleash your siblings and they'll come after you anyways. And he's like, no, no, no. Highburn's not even that foolish to let them loose. He also tells them if they really knew his siblings, where he is now is a much more preferable situation, which is just wild. Yeah. They need to head back as they are going to the Hewan City and do not want to be late. The Bone Carver knows that this is their last attempt to rally the troops for the Night Court. He wonders what Care's price will be. And he's like, hmm, interesting. Yeah. How doesn't he already know, though? <laughs> He probably does. He's just like not telling them. Yeah. (laughs) The bone carver says he will think about helping them in this war if they are able to get a mirror, which is called the Ouroboros. Also, if they can find a way to free him. (laughs) So he's like, don't forget about this fact. I'm in the prison. I'm trapped here and I can't leave. So if you want me to help me, I need this mirror and I need you to find me a way out. Yeah. Feyre knows that Cassian wanted to see the bone carver to see if he knows what Nesta was. Like calls to like, but even the bone carver is stumped about who Nesta is. Cassian, though, says he is not scared of Nesta. If she is death or a death god, he would be more scared for her. He's like, I've faced death basically my whole life. I would be more scared for her to have this power that she really wouldn't know how to control than be scared of her. Yeah. Rhysand comes to pick Feyre and Cassian up. Cassian said that Reese was not going to like the bone carver's asking price. Reese is like, well, if he wants the fancy dinner plates, he can just have that. But <laughs> Feyre and Cassian were not in a laughing mood, and they just tell Reese to bring his bargaining skills tonight. Oh, boy. Chapter 24. Feyre goes to the House of Wind after visiting the bone carver. This girl is never stopping, never, never. sitting down for one. <laughs> second i'm literally exhausted just thinking about everything she does in one day yeah it's always so much like yeah i need a nap <laughs> they were wants to check in on her sisters and lucian she tried to fly into the house of wind but she fell onto one of the balconies thankfully nobody was watching she found her sisters in the library elaine had actually left her room Yay. Nesta tells Vera that she is ready for tonight to go to the court of nightmares and elaine is looking out the library window and favor wants to know what she is looking at here is a foreshadowing line that i picked out for chapter 24 page 246 elaine says i can hear the sea even at night even in my dreams the crashing sea and the screams of a bird made of Mm -hmm. fire we obviously learn at the end of the section that she's a seer but this is totally foreshadowing yeah this is the first time we see her kind of rambling nonsense or exactly what we think is yeah. nonsense at the time <laughs> they yeah. tries to talk to her about the garden at the townhouse but elaine gives another cryptic answer she was like am i going to be able to hear the worms in the earth and just <laughs> this weird <laughs> shit so fever is like uh nesta we need to have a little chit chat by ourselves away from elaine yeah. because this is some <laughs> weird shit 
She's a little cuckoo yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> so Feyre makes Nesta go into the library stacks with her so they can have a private conversation away from Elaine. Though they do both look at the window that Elaine is staring at, making sure that it cannot be opened and she will not jump out of it, which is where they're at with Elaine yeah. and her mental health. Crazy. Nesta said that she found Elaine in the library, that she woke up this morning and she found Elaine wasn't in her bed, which I can only imagine the 5,000 heart attacks that Nesta had until she located her. Yeah, literally. She was probably freaking out. Feyre wants more details, but Nesta says she's been talking in riddles all day and she doesn't know when it started. She only checks up on her every few hours, but Nesta is feeling guilty for leaving her too long yesterday while she was training with Amran. And Nesta asks, does she have powers like mine? And Feyre's like thinking in her head, well, what are your powers, Nesta? Yeah, I'm thinking that in my head too. Which I just (laughs) don't know why Feyre didn't just ask her right then. Yeah. Yeah. But Nesta wants Feyre to investigate Elaine now. But Feyre's like, we do not have time. We are going to the Hewan City in a few hours. And she's like, you don't want people messing around in your head or asking you invasive questions. I doubt that Elaine does too. We shouldn't be shoving into her business if you don't want people shoving into yours. Very true. They talk about Nesta's training, not just her magical training, but that she she also be training physically. And she's like, why do I have to train with Cassian? Why can't it be with Azriel or the blonde one? (laughs) Nesta also says there are many types of strength beyond the ability to wield a blade. Amran told her that yesterday. So she is correct, but I do think it would be helpful, especially as we see in later chapters, if she was in shape. (laughs) Her and Amran, though? I know. They're an unlikely duo, and they're pretty tight. Yeah, I know. Lucian then enters the library and starts a conversation with Elaine. Feyre enters his thoughts to see what his intentions are since he was breaking the rules. Lucian asks Elaine if there's anything he can get for her. He notices that the tea was set up and knows Nesta must be nearby. So he kind of wants to make this interaction (laughs) quick, but he can't, you know, pass up this opportunity of talking to his mate when she is just standing there by the window alone. Yeah, he's definitely looking over his shoulder (laughs) for Nesta and her wrath. (laughs) He notices that Elaine is too pale, too thin, and he wants to get her to eat something. Elaine, to his surprise, does speak to him. Wait, before you go on, isn't it so funny that he finds that Elaine is too pale and too thin and wants to give her some food, but never did it for fucking Feyre back in the spring court? Little shits. (laughs) Elaine, to his surprise, does speak to him. Lucian thought she was the most beautiful female he had ever seen. Oh, we've heard that before. (laughs) Yes, we have, which is making me a little (laughs) nervous that they are actually mates because I go back and forth, right? We see things and I'm like, totally not mates. And then we get to some things. I'm like, nope, that's definitely a point for they are mates column. So (sighs) yeah, but I think it makes sense. Your theory that Lucian does think that they're mates, but it's just not true. Yeah. Like somebody is toying with him. Yeah, I guess we won't know until we know, until Sarah wants us to know, which, hello, Sarah, where are you? And what is the date and release of your next book? And what is the name of it? Aka what? We need to know. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This feeling of Elaine being the most beautiful female he has ever seen makes him feel yucky because he had also said the same thing about Jasminda. Elaine goes, who are you? (laughs) And... Before Lucian says who he is, or he says who he is, but in the back of his head is also has thoughts of what he's been doing in the meantime, which is really weird. Like you're having a conversation with (laughs) your mate, Elaine, for the first time you're alone with no chaperones around. And you're thinking about your conversation with Asriel and (laughs) the information that you gave him about your family. It just seems- A point where they're not mates. (laughs) Yeah. It just seems like a really (laughs) odd time to be thinking that. Yeah. But Elaine does recognize his name as Feyre's friend from her stories and that he was in Highburn and had betrayed them. And Lucian tells her it was all a mistake. Elaine continues on that she was supposed to be married in a few days because this is someone new, someone she hasn't told yet that she wants to go home and she was supposed to be married in a few days. Though Lucian thinks that she knows exactly who 
he is to her. And now she's telling him, I was supposed to be married in a few days, is probably not a great feeling for Lucian. No. Elaine also tells him, I can hear your heart. I can hear your heart beating through the stone. Can you hear mine? The stone? Which he responds to, I cannot. So he cannot hear her heart beating. And I just think it, that's a yeah. point away from their family. mating bond. Yeah. Like that was the whole point of Feyre realizing that she can stab Tamlin in Akratar was because she realized his heart was blocked by stone or, or was made of stone or whatever. The only thing that would disprove this, that the stone and Tamlin is that when the spell was broken and Tamlin got his powers back, that the stone was broken and was released. And now his heart is there. Cause I think favor does hear his heart beating later after at the end of Akatar. But at the same time, it's interesting that she says, I can hear your heart beating through stone or the stone. And it's just like, Maybe it could still refer to Tamlin because his heart at one point was made of stone and she could probably yeah. see that because we know now she's a seer. True. Doesn't she mention like a black box of stone or something? Yeah, you said that earlier. Yeah, so there's another mention of some stone. I'm like, hmm. And it's weird. Like, why can't he feel her? Well, he does tug on the bond later in this episode but like if she can hear his heart beating while she's even asleep why can't he hear hers it's just perplexing to me that's why i just go back and forth between who is elaine's mate (laughs) because i don't know if i really truly believe that it's lucian anywho moving on (laughs) elaine says to lucian when he says that he cannot she says no one has ever really saw her only that the Lord Grayson did, and now he will not. Which is really sad because I really feel like that's yeah. true. That no one has actually seen who Elaine truly is. We just see her through, you know, Feyre's eyes and then how Nesta treats her and how the father treated her. But we don't yeah. know who Elaine truly is. And she's basically saying that now. She's like, you, no one knows who I am. No one can truly see who I am inside. Yes, I'm this beautiful face, but no one really sees me. And yeah. she felt like the Lord Grayson really did see her and who she truly was. And now that's being taken away from her, which is just. But also on the flip side, she was like the social one, the social butterfly. So do you think that maybe she was just finally getting the attention that she was seeking from all these people in these social events? Or maybe that was just a mask that she wears. Yeah, maybe. So hopefully all these masks, hopefully we'll find out who Elaine truly is in the new Akadar book. <laughs> hopefully. Aka what? <laughs> Nesta knows that Feyre had slipped inside of Lucian's head to hear his thoughts during his conversation with Elaine. Feyre said that she has never slipped into Nesta's mind, but she has no idea how Nesta knew that, how Nesta yeah. knew that Feyre had slipped into Lucian's mind. Because Nesta also knows everything. <laughs> yeah. How did she know that? I mean, Feyre's probably like staring off into space. I imagine she's just like, but still, like she could just be like listening intently. How did she know that she had slipped into Lucian's mind and she was no longer yeah. like she's in her not, own she's mind? She's not like a good guesser or something. Like she knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nesta then comes out of the stacks and kicks Lucian out. Lucian says that Elaine needs fresh air. And Nesta's like, we will decide what she needs. <laughs> but favor enough. Don't you tell me what she needs. Yeah, don't you tell me what my Elaine needs. <laughs> Feyre announces that all of them, Lucian included, are moving into the townhouse effective immediately. They're literally in the House of Wind, secluded from everybody in Valoris. They can't even leave without taking 10,000 steps down or being <laughs> yeah, blown yeah. out. <laughs> it's just not ideal. Definitely need some fresh air. Even though they have a nice balcony, they need fresh yeah, air. Yeah, <laughs> they need to be able to walk around outside. It's very different. Yeah, and explore a little. Yeah. Yeah. The gang heads back to the townhouse. Resan carries Nesta. Cassian carries Lucian. And Asriel took Elaine. Feyre tried to fly back, but she starts to fall. So she winnows the rest of the way home waiting for them. Elaine is brought in by Az, who she called beautiful. And he Mm. escorts her out to the gardens. 
Nesta comes in a moment later needing a toilet to throw up in and Lucian is <laughs> pissed because he can smell as with the lane out in the garden. Oh shit. Nesta comes out of the bathroom looking like she wants to kill Reese. Yes and I have a little foreshadowing line here that I was so proud of myself for pulling out. <laughs> Chapter 24 page 255. Her eyes remain the same blue gray as my own and yet Molten ore was all I could think of. Quick silver set a flame. Quick silver set a flame? Like a court of silver flames? Hmm. <laughs> so now my official prediction for whose point of view that book is in is Nesta. Hmm. 110%. <laughs> and you don't have to confirm until we get there, but I will die on that hill now. Okay. <laughs> Cassian stops her by saying he was kicked out of the townhouse for a month after brawling with Amran. Her eyes go back to being normal. Or as normal and mortal as they would ever look. <laughs> Lucian is like, what are you? <laughs> He's totally <laughs> freaked out by Nesta right now. <laughs> and all she will say is she made it give her something back before heading upstairs to her new room. Yes. And here's my notable line for chapter 24, page 256. The flame in her eyes was not of your usual sort, I take it. Lucian shook his head. No, it spoke to nothing in my own arsenal. That was ice, so cold it burned. Ice and yet fluid like flame, or flame made of ice, Farah says. I think it's death. Yes, which Reese then wow. says, only Nesta would not just conquer death, but pillage it. <laughs> yes. Like, of course it's Nesta. <laughs> Farah never thought to ask her sisters how long it it had felt that they were in the cauldron for when it only felt like seconds for them. So for Nessa to tear apart the cauldron basically with her teeth, how long did it feel to them that they were under there for when it was literally yeah. like a snap of the finger for everyone else in that throne room? I wonder <laughs> if maybe while she was struggling, that's when she was like taking from it. Yeah, maybe. Because it took them a while to dunk her head finally. Yeah, that's true. Or maybe it was when she flicked them off and was like. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. Yeah. Then we have the mate talk. And Favor wants to know who decides when people are mates. And it has not chosen well before. And she gives the examples of Tamlin's parents and Rhysand's parents. Mm -hmm. And that's when Reese gives the explanation about mates, which Amanda did so lovely before that I will not repeat it. Thank you very much. Favor <laughs> thinks, why Lucian and Elaine and not Azrael and Elaine? Because it seems like Elaine feels very comfortable with Azrael and is yeah. more open to speaking to him or spending time with him just in silence than she is around Lucian. Is that because she knows she has this forced bond with Lucian that it just makes her uncomfortable and she doesn't really owe Azrael anything? I don't know. Or maybe she's just more attracted to Azrael. She does say he's the most beautiful thing she's ever seen. It's true. <laughs> Elaine could reject the bond, but Lucian would still feel the need to fight any male who Elaine decides to be with. So even if she rejects the bond, if Lucian ever came into contact with her and anyone that Elaine may decide to be with, he would still have this instinct to want to fight that male, even though the bond is rejected. Well, I hope it's not Azrael because Azrael will kill you, Lucian. <laughs> <laughs> Feyre is feeling guilty about going into Lucian's mind, but Reese is like, yeah, I would feel guilty too, but Lucian was also breaking the rules. He went into the library mm -hmm. where he wasn't supposed to be, and he was also talking to Elaine alone, which he also wasn't supposed to be doing. So you went in yeah. there to make sure that his intentions were good, because what if he went in there to try to grab her and escape? Yeah, I agree. So It's warranted. You break the rules, then she can break the rules. Exactly. All bets are All off. All bets are off at that point. Yep. <laughs> they finish this chapter getting ready for the Hewan City and Reese says, ready to be wicked? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Chapter 25, The Throne Room. The inner circle minus Cassian walk into the throne room. They all stop at the bottom of the dais as Favor and Reese climb the steps and Reese has Favor sit in the throne. And he Ooh. just perches on the arm of the throne and the crowd is shook. Then Reese shook makes everyone bow. He's like, bow. So hot. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> a few individuals in the crowd try and test Feyre's power. Reese talks about how there will be a second throne in here the next time they come to visit. That not having one now must have been a mistake because their visit was so quick and pretty much unannounced until they were coming. So he'll forgive it just this once. If not, yeah, next time heads will roll. I want the heads to roll. I'm excited. I hope there's no second throne next time. <laughs> When the crowd rises again, Feyre launches her power at the three individuals who are trying to test her out. Care is just sneering basically this entire chapter. <laughs> Rhysan says it's not polite to touch a lady without their permission, while Feyre tells them to play nice. And it's like they have this wicked persona that they have, but Feyre is still Feyre at the end of the day. She can try to be wicked, but... She doesn't have a mean bone in her body in real life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Rhysand dismisses the crowd when, you know, Amran and Nesta approach the bottom of the dais, basically to see if they can be excused. And he is like, yep. Everyone can just be dismissed and go away. And he tells Care to meet him in the council chambers while Nesta and Amran go to practice Nesta skills and to train with finding magical objects in the trove. Yes. We are two best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are now in the council chamber. Reese and Feyre sit at the head of either side of the table. So here they will enforce formality because they kind of have to to keep Kira in check. Yeah, it's definitely different than Valaris. Kira already knows why they are there. Reese wants his dark bringers for the war. But Kira says he's feeling sympathetic towards Highburn and their cause for this war. Of course he is. He's like, I just feel stifled. There's not enough room for us under here. The whole mountain doesn't even belong to us with your palace atop of it. And Reese is like, well, all of this belongs to me, Care. But if you want the yeah. palace so badly, you can have it. And Care kind of taunts him. What, are your overgrown bats not doing it for you? And <laughs> it's just so ridiculous because I don't think Care would be very happy if the King of Highburn was now in charge of his lands. He wouldn't be able to be yeah. a steward and being in charge of the Hewen city. He would be nothing. He would be a nobody. Yeah, I feel like he's just so annoying and power hungry that he knows he has this one power over Rhysand that he doesn't have to say yes. So he's just going to give him shit no matter what, because it's the one time he literally can. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Without breaking every bone in his body. When Kira says he already has his asking price in mind, he is looking at Feyre, which does not go Sicko. over well. Kira does not like how they had humiliated him the last time they were there. And mentions of Amarantha were brought up, which is just disgusting. Yeah. And here's my notable line for chapter 25, page 267. Reese says in response to Kier, the bargain our ancestors struck grants you the right to choose how and when your army assists my own, but it does not grant you the right to keep your life, Kier, when I grow tired of your existence. Mm -hmm. Booyah! Booyah! <laughs> Put him right back in his place. Exactly. At the bottom of the food chain. Yes. Reese says, I thought you might be hesitant to help me, so he brings in heiress to everyone's surprise but Azrael's. Yeah, that blew my mind. Which brings us to chapter 26, the bombshell that is Eris. Care seems mm -hmm. very wary of Eris, and Rhi says that Care has always wanted ties to the Autumn Court, so here is his chance having a formal alliance with Care providing services for the war. Care says that having an alliance with the Autumn Court is not enough for him to agree to this war. He wants Valaris. Un restrained access for him and his people. Reese says, no, there will be limitations on when and how many, but that will be decided later. Feyre realizes that that was what the meeting was about at the palaces, that Reese had planned for this. Mm -hmm. Moore is hurt by the betrayal of him not telling her or the group what he was planning prior to bringing Eris and offering up Valaris, yeah. which I have so many thoughts on this. I know. Because Feyre does not get upset at all. She does question him down the bond and is like, literally calls him by his full name and not just Reese. And that's how we know she is pissed at him. 
But then it's kind of like, it's fine that you didn't tell me this when she has specifically asked him over and over again to keep her part of the plans, to not keep her yeah. from anything. And she is the high lady of the night court. He's having these yeah. meetings without her when she should be present. And I have to just say this, is that if Tamlin had done this to her, she would be fucking rip roaring mad, screaming, doing whatever, fighting Tamlin. But Reese gets the yeah. grace of this is war and we need to keep a united front which tamlin has just been saying the entire fucking time so it just makes well, me mad that there's this like double standard here because yeah no definitely i have to criticize i agree in this moment but all i can think of is the conversation that they had where basically they were saying they weren't going to go against each other in front of anybody and that's fine she didn't go against him in that moment but she does not yeah. once give him shit for it when they're alone and in private yeah, it's true It's true. I mean, there is a fuck ton of shit going on right now, but you're right. She totally would have gave Tamlin shit for that. Because if he's going to do that. Like right away. Yeah. And if he's going to do this now already, what else is he going to do behind her back and not tell her about when they're supposed to be this united front and making decisions together because they're equals? So it I know. It kind of. What was he thinking? Was it because she's training with Asriel and Cassian? She's just busy doing shit? Or is it because he's being a shady shade shade? I think he played it really shady. And I think that doesn't excuse anything because you see Farah how, and you know, she is kind of running herself rampant, but this is war. You cannot make decisions on your own when it infects the entire group. And he apologizes to more, but I think he also owes an apology to Feyre. I think, yeah. you know, he talks about how she's his equal in every way. Well, you're not making it seem like she's your equal. It looks like you made this decision without her. It was clear across her face. Care could see it. Eris could see it. More could see it. That whole group could see that Feyre did not know about this. And it's fucked up that only Asriel knew. He's not yeah. your high lord. You're not married to Azrael. I know. Yeah, I just, it doesn't sit right with me. This whole scene doesn't sit right with me. I don't like what Reese did. And I don't like that in private, Favor didn't give him shit for it. She was just like, it's okay. It's not okay. And yeah, I think this, if this was another high lord in this situation, there would have been a screaming match in his office later that night. Yeah. His intentions too, I think were in the right place with, trying to figure out a way that he could give Valeris to care, but not fully unrestricted. You know what I mean? That's, he, the meeting was about him I, telling everybody that basically to give him hell when he gets there. Yeah. Like he's not going to have it easy at Valeris. I don't disagree what the with the decisions that Rhysand made. I disagree mm-hmm. how he went about it. And, you know, even Amarin says that we'll talk about that later. I guess we should just continue. I don't disagree with yeah. re- what with <laughs> what Reese did. I'm I'm just it's not even so much going behind. Yeah, it's just a double standard. It's yeah. not even what he did to more because I could give two shits about that. It's what he did to Feyre in this moment and taking power away from her when people are already questioning if she should have this power. Yeah. OK, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Before Kara leaves the room, Vera asks for the Ouroboros, and we know that she will only be able to take it if she looks into the mirror and conquers it. High Lords have gone mad looking into it, like Amanda explained earlier. Eris mm-hmm. is asking price is w- that when his father is gone, that they will support him in becoming High Lord of the Autumn Court over his brothers. Reese had erased his brothers' minds, but Eris was smart and knew that they would be coming. Eris also says that Moore and their group don't know what they're talking about when it came to what happened to Moore that day, that there were other powers mm-hmm. at play and he wasn't going to waste his breath explaining it to them. Interessante. Yep. We learned that Eris was the one who got word to Tam Tam to help Lucian escape from the rest of his family. He wasn't there when Lucian's love was killed and he had refused to be there and was punished by his father. So it is giving Eris these redeeming qualities. So it does make you think yeah. like what really did happen that day with Moore, which we have a lot to yeah. say on and we'll discuss at a later time we have thoughts <laughs> on thoughts <laughs> era says that his father will side with them in the war and be unaware of what favor's gifts are which is good for us we like that thank you eris yes. <laughs> never thought we'd be saying that but thank you eris right right eris chides more saying every emotion was written on her face and she should school her features better eris also tells more that he never would have touched her but when she fucked cassian well, he knew why she did it, so he gave her 
her freedom. And Moore is shrinking away from him. She wrote shrinking twice. We need to talk about this, but I don't want to do that yet until I have all of my thoughts gathered or we yeah, have all same. of our thoughts gathered about how we want to present this. But just – yeah. We're just going to keep pointing out these weird inconsistencies when it comes to more. With more. Yeah, for sure. Azrael's like, well, what happened next after that? Yes. And this is actually my notable line for chapter 26, page 276. Eris says, there are a few things I regret. That is one of them. But perhaps one day, now that we are allies, I shall tell you why, what it costs me. Moore says she does not give a shit. And he just responds, see you at the meeting in 12 days. <laughs> He's like, la, 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 see you then. He also has that so- swagger like Resan does. <laughs> Chapter 27. Back at the townhouse, the Reese and Moore fight. Mm-hmm. All six of the group arrived back at the townhouse pissy. Cassian and Lucian joined the group and stood close to Moore, who was crying. Moore wants to know why. Re said Eris found Azrael and their hands were tied. When Moore turns to Azrael about why he didn't say anything, he said that he knew she would try to have stopped it and they can't afford to lose Kara's alliance and have the threat of Eris in this war. They just can't yeah. have any complications at this time. Yeah, they need him on their side, so. Yes. And Kier. Yes. Reese caught up Cassian through mind-to-mind talking and... Feyre also thought the others in the room were also being caught up by Resand about what had happened in the council chamber. Moore said she was most upset about Reese giving up Valaris, even with the restrictions, her father will find some way to destroy it. This is when Reese does admit that he had met with the governors of the palaces and they have all been told that all the business owners not to serve anybody from the Hewan city, that they may come here, but they will find it very hard to get lodgings while well, they won't be able to get lodgings at all or be able to no. enjoy themselves in any way. You'll just be walking the streets and that's it. <laughs> Hungry and with all your money in your pocket stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Moore said, how would you feel if Amarantha showed up on this doorstep and you were forced to work with her? Yes. And this is my notable line for chapter 27, page 279. If Amarantha offered us a slim shot at survival, then I would not give a shit that she made me fuck her for all those years. If Amarantha showed up at the door right now and said she could buy us a chance at defeating Highburn, at keeping all of you alive, I would thank the fucking cauldron. Mm -hmm. Sassy, but lies. Lies, lies, lies. Yeah. (laughs) And Moore's like, you do not mean that. I think everyone knew he did not mean that. Yeah. I mean, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Amran is the voice of reason at this moment. She said she held this group together for 49 years and she would not allow them to break now. Amran calls Reese a sneaky bastard and the call he made was correct, but the way he went about it is wrong, which is totally strike two for Reese. Totally correct. He definitely went about this the wrong way. And yes, the inner circle should have been told, but I think above all, I don't give a shit about more being told and her feelings about Eris and Valoris and whatever. His most important person that he should have been telling is his literal high lady. They are equal 50-50% and he's making decisions on his own and it's just not right. And I think he should be called out on it, not just being called out on it by Amra and saying it was sneaky and the inner circle should have known. Yeah, I agree. Come on, Feyre. Take the rose-colored glasses off. (laughs) Literally. Feyre, ever the voice of reason, though, says that they all have to stick together through this war or they will fail. And Azrael agrees with her. They Okay, Tamlin. Yeah. <laughs> we need – and Lucian. We all need to be – literally, it would have been so great if Lucian was like, oh, now you want to be a united front? I know. Literally. <laughs> they talk about the mirror because Cassian asks about it, I believe. And – she tells the group what she would have to do in order to retrieve it, which brings us to Amran. Amran wants yeah. to know why they want the mirror. Feyre tells her, since they're all being honest about what <laughs> what they've been up to, that they went to the prison to visit the bone carver and what her intentions were. They all want to know how Amran escaped the prison. 
Amarin says it is not possible because she had to remove everything she was, bonding herself to mortal for her body to escape the prison because she was no longer who she truly was. That the bone carver mm-hmm. would need to do the same thing and then he would not be as effective as they would want him to be for this battle. We see how the group is still distrustful of Amarin in this moment because when they think she's about to explode... As is in his shadows, Re steps in front of Feyre, and even Nesta obeyed and stood behind Cassian and just peeked over his shoulder. Yeah. I would be too. I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to stay back here. <laughs> this little section ends with Elaine coming down the stairs saying she hadn't heard them come back. So this is when Elaine gives her other prediction or her little rambled speech that Amanda went over in her section about yeah. Elaine, about the old hands, young hands becoming old, the feather and the flame and whatever <laughs> the saying was. Yeah. And Asriel, it seems to click in his head about something and he winnows away. Now we have Feyre's update with Nesta and Lucian because this girl is still not done today. <laughs> <laughs> Nesta went into the trove with all these magical objects that would want to harm them. Her training was to fight their defenses and find their weaknesses. And that repairing was a whole other training. But Nessa says that she failed every time she tried to breach the magical object's defenses. They also don't know what to do about Elaine. Feyre doesn't think Reese can just go into her head and scramble it about as Nesta accused he may do if they were to look into what was going on with her. Nesta said maybe for her, immortality and beauty, maybe the price was to lose a part of her mind and that the cost for Nesta was watching Elaine suffer. Sad. That's so sad. Lucian comes back down the steps as he heard everything that had happened with Elaine and he wants to help. Feyre agrees that she will call a healer to come and look at Elaine and Lucian says to keep him up to date on what she says. Then finally to end this chapter there's a chat with Rhysand which it is not the correct chat that they should have been having but whatever. <laughs> Reese wakes her up from her sleep and he says that he isn't all right, that he should have found another way. I don't think he should have found another way. I think he just needed to be a bit more honest with his wife. Yeah. Reese said if Amarantha had showed up at the door, he would have killed her on sight and without even letting her speak. And Feyre's like, I know. <laughs> this is why he takes everything on himself because if he makes a bad call it's just on him and tonight it involved more and she cried but you could have had a partner you could have had Vera. like she would have stood by your yeah. by the bad mistake too and then it wouldn't all be on you so i guess it's a learning curve because he has been ruling alone for many many years but yeah, he also probably knew he was going to get some shit for it and didn't want Feyre to be involved to also get the shit well, for it. Well, too bad. That's what she gets I for know. being high lady. Like he could. She- but if he told her, then she, maybe she could have reasoned with him and decided on a different way together. And that's the point. Yeah, but- no, exactly. And if he just wanted Feyre to be his wife and his mate, then he should have just made her that. But he didn't. He made her high lady for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm, Come on, Reese. I'm worked up you about need to it. Upside the head. <laughs> Feyre asks about the mirror and if he would be able to look into it. And he's like, not right now. Not yet. Yeah, well, especially since you're lying to your own mate and high lady. Is that foreshadowing? Not yet. Maybe. Hmm. Foreshadowing. Chapter 28. Feyre attempts to fly into the House of Wind, but has another crash landing before training with Cassian. Feyre <laughs> then trains with Asriel on her flying, learning about winds and speed, and he was more quiet than usual, and he had not spoken to more. Feyre arrives back at the townhouse and sees more sitting at the dining room table. Feyre steals her pastry, as she should. We learned three <laughs> responses have come back from Day, Dawn, and Winter. Winter wants to bring mm-hmm. armed soldiers because he still doesn't trust anyone since Under the Mountain. Yeah. They have not heard back from Autumn, Summer, or Spring. Yes, and this is my notable line for Chapter 28, page 294. Feyre says, We don't have much time until the meeting. What if they refuse to reply at all? More response, then we'll have to decide if Reese and I will go drag them by their necks to this meeting or if we'll have it without them. <laughs> so casually, she's like, I'll fucking grab them by their necks and drag their asses. <laughs> Literally. And Faye's like, I don't know if this is the best way to make alliances. So maybe we shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. 
Moore had a conversation with Reese earlier that morning about why he did what he did to secure her father's alliance and bringing in Eris from selling what he knows about Feyre. She claims she would have done the same deal herself if it came down to that. Which I just don't understand why Reese was just apologizing to Moore. But whatever, I will just drop it for now. (laughs) Moore also says that she was not going to let these males get her down or they would win. The healer shows up to examine Elaine, and the healer can find nothing wrong with her body. She says she's too thin and she needs some fresh air, but besides that, nothing is wrong. I guess Lucian does know best because he said she needs some fresh air too. That is true. (laughs) The healer says she cannot see into her mind, though, because she is cauldron made. She suggests that Lucian, her mate, try sitting and talking with her to assess if there is anything amiss. Nesta is a furious about this and wants Feyre to call another healer. And Feyre's like, what? So you can chase another one out the door? I, I don't think so. Yeah. Let's see what <laughs> let's see what Lucian can do first, and then we'll talk about bringing in another healer. Well, not to mention this healer has also been healing the inner circle since the war. Yeah, since the dawn of time. <laughs> Yeah, she just finished repairing Cassian's wings again. So I think she knows what she's fucking talking about. Yeah, if she (laughs) says this, I don't think we're going to hear a different answer from anybody else. No, but yeah, exactly. Nesta's so blinded by Elaine. Yeah. Lucian agrees and Feyre says that she will invite Elaine down. She will not be dragging her like Nesta suggests she would be doing. And Moore is going to stay with Feyre to monitor. And Lucian looks like he's just exasperated with all of them. And he's like, I'm just going to go clean myself up. This is like too much right now. <laughs> get get the fuck out of here. I got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Chapter 29. The Lucian and Elaine awkward tea. <laughs> Moore and Feyre are sitting by the window, Nesta and Amran are in the dining room training, and Elaine and Lucian are not speaking to each other at all with tea in between them. Feyre wants to know if what Elaine and Lucian's mating bond felt like and if it felt normal, which... It's just weird to... S- yeah. We had a conversation about this because when we were reading it, because Reese and Feyre are both Damati, do they still have that bridge like they see? Or is it something different? What is a normal bond feeling like? And I just think it's interesting yeah. that she doesn't think that her bond with Reese is normal or like ordinary like everyone else is. But yeah. I wonder if Feyre is like, oh, no, I really don't believe that illusion. I know. I think made. she's kind of catching on here. Yeah. Reese and Cassian are arriving back at the townhouse, but Feyre makes them not come in, which is just a hilarious banter scene between her and Reese and her head. And he's like, well, I'm not getting involved with any of this. And yeah. literally Feyre flicks them off, which then, this is funny, Moore sees what's going on and also gives the vulgar gesture, which is kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, she just joins in. She's like, oh, we're flicking Reese oh, off? Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, Feyre doesn't want to startle Elaine, but Lucian's going to do that anyways because Lucian pulls on the bond and Elaine does, in fact, freak out, which has Nesta storming into the living room and escorting Elaine into the garden. Lucian says that, you know, he felt the bond or the line or whatever, and he was getting across it until he got to Elaine's end, and that's when she basically freaked out. So there is obviously something there. But yeah, I don't know. I just think something's amiss. And I guess we're going to have to keep reading on to see if there's any more evidence that they are not mates or if they are. Yeah, this is kind of hard to disprove because there's an actual physical thread there. Yeah. And we know that Resan pulled it when Feyre died. Yeah. To keep her hanging on. So if he can touch it, I mean... Well, that's pretty hard to argue. <laughs> I know. The only thing but. that I can think of is from another series, and I won't mention names, but there are a set of characters that think that they're mates and that they feel a tug towards each other, like a protectiveness, but it's not real. So that's why I'm like, is it real mm. or not? Is someone just fucking with Lucian and Elaine or, or yeah. messing with Feyre in some way through Elaine? So... I don't know. We'll see. We're going to keep reading. Yeah, we'll see. Amarin is like, can someone get Nesta back? Her lesson was not over. <laughs> now we have Feyre's latest flying lesson featuring large trees. <laughs> George, George, George of the jungle, watch out for that tree. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Feyre is not doing a very good job with her flying lesson. She keeps hitting trees <laughs> that she could have sworn were not there previously. Okay, George of the Jungle, we see you. <laughs> we get to see Azrael have a personality and crack some jokes, which I think yeah. he does better probably with one-on-one -on -one interactions than he does in a big group. So it is kind of nice to yeah, have conversations with Azrael and see, you know, who he really is and spending this time with him. Yeah, I know. They really haven't gotten much one-on-one -on -one time before these flying lessons. So Yeah, for sure. Feyre updates us on the mirror and the research she's been doing on it, and there is no way around without looking into the mirror to conquer it. When is about to jump off again, Azrael's like, well, we could go for somewhere lower. And she's like, lower? I thought this was low. And then she's like, can you just push me? He's like, no. <laughs> push you. No, I will not do that. Yeah. Feyre now knows that she will not be flying with the legions during the war. Azrael explains to her that any advantage she could have when the time comes could make a big difference. The Nefel philosophy. Yes. And Amanda did such a lovely recap earlier of the story Azrael tells Feyre. Thank you. You're welcome. And here is my notable line for chapter 29, page 309. We... Reese, Cass, and I will occasionally remind each other that what we think to be our greatest weakness can sometimes be our biggest strength, and the most unlikely person can alter the course of history. The Nefel philosophy. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. <laughs> For sure. We get a steamy Reese and Feyre scene after he draws her a bath and gives her a massage for her sore and painful muscles and wings. Apparently, Feyre has the dirtiest mouth he has ever heard, though we don't get to hear what she actually says. And <laughs> Feyre wishes that they had the all the days to spend like this together. And Reese says, we will, basically, one day. We will. Yeah. I wish somebody would massage me like that. Oh, my God. It sounded so <laughs> lovely. My back has really it been hurting. So nice. And I'm like, oh. I know. I need someone to really get in there and just dig their hands in. Yeah. And even like up the thighs. Oh, oh that would be so nice. I know. Full body massage. I, we should book a <laughs> – we should book – a massage because we really deserve it after we, we sit here for a long time recording these episodes I know. we need I know. massages after that that's what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> chapter 30 favor sends word to both Azrael and cassian that she would not be training with either of them that day which has them both flocking to the household like what is happening what is wrong with you <laughs> Yeah. And only Azrael <laughs> brings her some sort of concoction to help with the pain. Feyre will be going to the House of Wind today to show Nesta the library and do research on the cauldron in the wall. Nesta and Elaine were having breakfast when Cassian and Azrael arrive. Elaine looks at Cassian and says, he snapped your wings, broke your bones, which <laughs> it just makes me so hilarious to have Elaine on standby at all times, like saying yeah. weird <laughs> stuff. She just looks up with you with the muffin in her hand and she's like you yeah. snapped your wings and broke your bones or she sang it so sweetly i really don't know how she's saying this but i can just imagine everyone just being like <laughs> like what a party yeah pooper. i picture her having a blank stare and just being like he cracked your wings and broke your bones <laughs> and then she snaps out of it snapped your and wings. then yeah back to being elaine just eating her breakfast <laughs> yeah <laughs> This is actually my notable line for chapter 30, page 315. Cassian says, it'll take more than that to kill me. And Elaine says, no, it will not. What the fuck does that mean, Elaine? I know. You see her? I wish somebody asked for clarification in that moment, but whatever. I know. Well, I don't think they realize that she is technically a seer yet, but still. Hum on like that would make my skin crawl if someone said that to me yeah i would be like why like, would you, you say mean? that elaine yeah yeah wild and i hope nothing happens to cassian but this is not promising news yeah. from elaine <laughs> yeah asriel then escorts elaine out into the garden he's like come on you little mental patient like let's go <laughs> Feyre widows and then tries to land at the House of Wind while Cassian carries Nesta. We are now in the library. Yes. Nesta and Feyre are looking for books about the wall, the cauldron, repairing, any research they can be doing on what Nesta's been training on. Nesta says mm -hmm. that she does not know exactly what she's looking for, just that she will know when she sees it, according to Amran. Nesta comments on Feyre not being able to read and... 
that she never knew that Feyre couldn't. She didn't know where she was at with her studies when they had lost everything. And is basically like, why didn't you ask us to teach you? And she's like, well, I didn't think that you would. They didn't have a very good relationship for Feyre to be like, hey, why we're dying and starving? Can you teach me (laughs) how to read this book? I can't imagine that it would have gone over very well. No, she definitely would have had a bitchy remark back and been like, go fuck off. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> Feyre asks Nesta. Don't you have some hunting to do? <laughs> right? Feyre asks Nesta while she's basically only nice to Elaine. But before she can answer, they are interrupted by a power, which I really think smacked Nesta across the face when she said things like that. Because she says again, Nesta is the only one that went to try to get her back over the wall. And yeah. we've seen moments of Nesta being a true big sister and trying to stick up for Feyre, but it's very inconsistent. And I think it's just very confusing to Feyre. And he's like, what kind of relationship do we have? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's confusing to me too, because she claims to be so supportive and blah, 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 but she does it in the bitchiest way, but she does not do it in a bitchy way to Mm -hmm. Elaine. So it's like, why do you have to be a bitch? That's how I took that scene. I know you care about me and I know you love me and I know you want the best for me, but you're a fucking bitch to me and you're really nice to Elaine. So what the fuck did I do to you? (laughs) Two Highburn soldiers, one dark haired and one light haired ravens for the king of Highburn have come to collect Nesta. Dun, dun, dun. Wild. Nesta over Feyre. That just makes me feel like she, I know it's because of the cauldron, but like she's got to be fucking powerful. Mm-hmm. They throw Fabian at them, diminishing all their powers. Feyre's like, not again. Yeah, she's like, no. They say Feyre is an unexpected surprise. They weren't expecting her to be there with Nesta, but the king will be happy to have her as well. The ravens tell Nesta she took too much from the cauldron and now the king wants her to give it back. That's why the cauldron couldn't take down the wall on its own because of what Nesta did. Chapter 31. Feyre is contemplating how they are going to escape the two highburn ravens. One, they can fight. Two, she can run up the library, but she didn't want to terrorize the priestesses further. Or their last option was they could run down and have the monster that lay beneath eat the ravens, basically. They yeah. decide, or Favor decides, that they're going to be running down. And they ran down a lot further and further into the pit. The Which high- is kind of risky because, yeah, they could eat the ravens, but it could eat you too. Yeah. <laughs> but sure, let's just run into the pit. <laughs> I know. Are you sure you don't want to terrorize the priestesses? This sounds like a, yeah. you know, apologize later is better than getting eaten by a monster. Yeah, exactly. The hybrid soldiers taunted them as they continue to run. They tell them about the mortal queens, how only one went in and the cauldron was pissed and made her an old crone. Now, none of the others would go in after that and how the queens want Nesta dead after what she took from the cauldron. Feyre realizes that Elaine saw this coming, the ravens, what happened to the queens. Feyre is starting to piece this all together. Mm -hmm. Feyre has Nesta run towards the light in the pit. And Nesta doesn't want to leave Feyre. This is where I think her older sister abilities start kicking in for her. Is She's like, I don't yeah. want to leave Feyre. Why should she be the one? She doesn't have her powers either. But anyways, she listens to Feyre, runs towards the light, and Feyre starts knocking shelves down to block Hybern's path to her. But it was also blocking Feyre's path out. Mm-hmm. As Feyre continues to search for a way out or the monster in the dark, she is begging for help. When the Highburn Ravens call her the High Lady of the Night Court, she finds that the monster is actually right behind her. Mm -hmm. The monster says he will make a deal with her, just like the deal she was going to make with the Carver, which is so interesting how he says the whispers of the land tell him everything. So... He knows a lot that's going on. And it's interesting because Amran had said in a couple of chapters above when she didn't want to talk about how she escaped from the prison, that the whispers and the land hears everything. And she didn't want anyone to come back and find her to bring her back to that prison. And Feyre puts up that sound shield, which I guess just proves Amran's point here when this monster knows about what Feyre was doing at the prison. Yeah, but it didn't know she was the high lady. 
Yeah, I know. That's weird. So, hmm. Can't know everything, well, I guess. I think, <laughs> well, I guess he didn't know her by face. But he's like, oh. Yeah, he that's says, true. He says, you're the high lady of the night court. So he knew yeah. there was one. Yeah, that's true. That's true. This is my notable line for chapter 31, page 325. Feyre says, what is your price? The monster under the library says, company, send me company to eat, to tell me about life. It's a bargain. So Feyre makes a bargain with the monster, but the monster is actually quite kind to Feyre. He tells her to close her eyes before he goes to kill the Highburn Ravens, which I think is very interesting. He didn't want to frighten her. Yeah, I think that's very interesting, too. And I also think it's good to note, since we're never going to see her again, that she thinks of Alice in this moment. And she was like, Alice did say never to make a bargain, but here I am ignoring everything (laughs) Alice says for the millionth time. Again. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The next thing Farrah knows, besides the screaming and the ravens being eaten, is Cassie and grabbing her and telling her not to look. And she's like, bitch, I was not looking anyways. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Reese arrives and also blocks her sight as he knew she would turn around and look and tells Cassian to get them out of here. Cassian takes Feyre and Nesta and Nesta goes to him without a fight and they take off into the air just as more screaming started again. Yeah, I mean, Feyre has her eyes closed, but does Nesta? I wonder if she got to see what the beast looks like or the monster looks like i know i wonder before reese put up that dark wall of black smoke if nesta saw because she's like yeah i know chapter 32 we're back in the house of wind in the family library room cassian pours them each a drink and nesta gulps hers down in one go which makes me seem to think that she did yeah, see what the monster was saw that. <laughs> yep for sure <laughs> cassian tells them that the king was not in the city and Reese comes back up from the library and he is covered in blood. Reese wants to know about the bargain she made with the monster as he spots the tattoo on her left arm. Feyre says that the monster just wants to talk to people, but she didn't specify it would be her and she didn't specify when it would happen. Reese says that the twin ravens were dead, that the monster had left enough of them for Reese to take a look into their minds and then finish killing them, which is very interesting that this monster is very smart and would yeah. know that Reese would want to take a look into their minds about what they had been brought from Highburn for and what Highburn's plans were before finishing killing them. And he also even gave him the opportunity to do that, which makes it seem like they will work together almost. Yeah, this monster definitely has self-control. Yeah, for sure. And I just really Hmm. keep going back to the moment where the monster's like, close your eyes. I just think, (laughs) oh. I know. I think we'll have another ally in this war now. I just think, why should I be like, oh, the monster said to close her eyes before he murders people. But it just makes me, it's just so kind. Well, I think too, because he just wants company. So we know he's like this lonely, nice little guy. Even though he's really, everybody thinks he's scary. I know. (laughs) Aw. Reese is pissed. He's like, why? What's wrong? Because Feyre tries to talk to him through the bond, but he responds verbally. And he's like, Highburn broke into my home. He broke through my wards. He tried to take my weight. He's going on and on and on. And Feyre's like, mm-hmm. calm down. Amrit is working on the wards again, and they will be looking for any lingering Highburn soldiers. We then see Cassian's point of view of when he landed and found Nesta, and she pointed him towards Feyre. But what is so interesting is she ran to Cassian. She ran with arms wide open, grabbing him. I think she was going to hug him, but then realized what she was doing and then just grabs him and is like, (laughs) Feyre. Yeah, literally. (laughs) But I also think Feyre seeing that memory shows too that Nesta really does care about her and wanted her to be safe as well. No, for sure. Treating her like Elaine in that moment. (laughs) Right. Reese says that he can live with her tattoo. And she's like, you can live with it. It's literally on her body. (laughs) But he knows what the inner circle's punishment will be when they misbehave, that they will have to go and spend an hour with the monster. And Cassian's like, I'd rather clean toilets. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, I will be sitting that one out. Yes. Back at the townhouse... Azrael was on the roof watching. Lucian was looking out the window on guard, but Moore was sitting too casually 
next to Elaine on the couch. The words specifically in the book were too casually. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. And I would think maybe it's like, oh, well, we don't want to freak Elaine out. But Lucian's literally standing by the window with a knife in his hand. And and Asriel's on the roof with all his weapons. So it's just interesting that she's sitting too casually next to Elaine. Hmm. Interessante. Indeed. (laughs) They discuss that they cannot let this attack get out into the world. The first attack on Valaris was a surprise to them and can be excused, but not this one. It would make them look unprepared and weak. Mm -hmm. Because more points out, well, there's already been an attack on Valaris. And they're like, well, this is different. The first time was a a surprise. Where were you, more for that attack? Yeah, and where were you (laughs) just this time, too? Yeah. Elaine says the queen might come. And they want to know which queen. And she says the one that was cursed with fire and feathers. Feyre brings up what the cauldron did to the young queen and it made her old when Elaine says, no, not that one. Everyone seems to be concerned Mm. that Elaine is just crazy when Asriel stops them and says, yes, this is my notable line for chapter 32, page 334. She doesn't need anything, Asriel answered, without so much as looking at Lucian. Elaine was staring at the spymaster now, unblinkingly. We're the ones who need dot dot dot, Asriel trailed off. A seer, he said, more to himself than to us. The cauldron made you a seer. Which is so interesting that Asriel is so in tune with Elaine that he knows exactly what she's doing or why she's saying what she's saying. Like, Lucian doesn't know. He just thinks she's fucking nuts. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I know. So, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Wild. That's true. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, he's very in tune with Elaine. And Elaine yeah. has no problems being around him. So I don't know what all this means, but all I know is that is the end of our chapters for this episode. And yep. we'll have to see <laughs> what happens in the next set. Yeah, what a great adventurous section. Yes. So before we close out this episode, though, I have two predictions that I want to mention. I have not been on my prediction game for this book. I just feel like there's so many crazy things happening. My brain is so jumbled after. I'm just like, what the fuck just happened? So yes. bear with me on my <laughs> on my predictions <laughs> for this section. But one, I think all the High Lords will be at this meeting. I know we haven't heard from a few yet. We kind of get the okay from Eris, but I think they're all going to be there, including Tamlin. And something Mm. crazy is going to happen. There's no way that all seven High Lords get together and something crazy does not happen. Like, it's just... Yeah. I just can't put my finger on what the hell is going to be. And I know I'm never going to guess in a million years, but something crazy (laughs) is definitely going down. I think multiple crazy things are going to go down. Yeah, agreed. And two, I think Feyre is going to be the one who keeps this monster company. And we're going to get a huge info download from that thing when the time comes. I think she's going to enjoy it and they're going to be friendly, kind of like he already was to her. Yeah. And she's on the hook if she doesn't keep the bargain. So I think she's going to be the one to fulfill that need for that monster. But I think it's going to come in handy. That's true. It is her bargain. Yeah. And they're definitely going to be allies for this war. Yeah. At least that monster is. So that's all we have for you today. I can't believe that Elaine is a seer and I can't wait to see what Nessa's powers really are. And hopefully we'll learn about that soon. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. Please let us know what you think by leaving us a review and comments on any of the platforms you are listening slash watching on or on our social media pages. This helps tremendously to get the word out and lead more listeners to find our show and tune in. Yes, don't forget to email, follow, subscribe, rate us five stars, and tell all your friends about us. We hope the rest of your day is blissful. Bye! Thank you so much for listening. Join us next week where we start part four of A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J. Moss, covering chapters 33 through 45. Happy reading! Happy reading!